Hello. Ah, okay. Thank you very much for the microphone. Okay, I'm going to be the, the chairman for the two next talks. We are restarting now with the next speaker, Sean Hill, uh, who is uh, uh, presently at Toronto, but he, uh, before that he worked with uh, Giulio Tononi and uh, made a model that uh, many of us know. Uh, and um, after that he went to EPFL where he stayed uh, 11 years. And after FAFL, he moved uh, to Toronto one year ago and is now the director of the new Neuroinformatics Institute in Toronto. Sean, I give you the microphone also. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and uh, I'll talk actually today a bit about each of those uh, the work in each of those places. So you'll learn a little bit about the work I did with uh, Giulio Tononi in Blue Brain, as well as what we're doing at the Kremble Center for Neuroinformatics in Toronto. So what, first of all, just a, a kind of context setting. One of, the, one of the great challenges that we have is, um, you know, we're dealing with many, many different observations of the nervous system across many different scales, from the subcellular, cellular, tissue level, whole brain. And our big challenge is, is finding those principles that help us relate those scales and understand, for example, how do genes influence cells, influence circuits, influence whole brain and behavior. And, um, and of course, in the context of consciousness, how does that fit into the, the generation of, of wakefulness and of sleep? And, um, and so with that, I wanted to take you through a little bit um, a, a familiar figure, I think Alain put up something very similar, but this is work from Steriade, uh, Oxen and Steriade, um, showing the transition from wakefulness to slow wave sleep in the cat, in the cerebral cortex. And um, what you see is, is basically this, this activated state, which Alain talked about, and a transition, to, so during wakefulness, and as you transition to slow wave sleep, that starts to become interrupted at the intracellular level with these, these hyperpolarizations. And in the EEG, that's reflected as this, this low voltage fast activity, and it becomes low frequency, high amplitude activity. And in, intracellularly, if you zoom in, you, you again, you see these up states and down states, and we'll talk a bit about that. And the question is, is so what, why is that important? Why is this observation at this particular scale relevant to understanding uh, wakefulness and relevant to understanding consciousness? And what's happening? What's happening in the brain to actually make that transition? Well, we know some things about, for example, the midbrain reticular formation, unit activity as you transition from wake to sleep. It basically decreases. So this is driving, the pumping these cocktail of neuromodulators into cortex to keep it awake. And these units start s basically slow their firing as you transition into wakefulness. Sorry, into sleep. <coughs> and so during wakefulness, you've got, a, again, this cocktail of hypocretin, norepinephrine, serotonin, histamine, acetylcholine, that are, that are really coming from these midbrain areas and projecting throughout the thalamus and cortex. And this is really driving uh, wakefulness. And when you go to sleep, you see a downregulation, a redu reduction in those neurotransmitters. So there's, there's something important here about the neuromodulation, right? What is it? And um, the question is, what, you know, what is this change in neuromodulation really doing to affect the conscious state? And one thing that I think is very important to know is that there, there are a couple of recent studies that show that in wakefulness, if you, if you block the thalamus, you've got no activity in cortex. Okay, so, so you don't have this uh, ongoing asynchronous activity percolating around cortex without the thalamus. You don't have working memory r ricocheting around cortical areas without the thalamus. So, in, you know, blocking the thalamus, basically within 10 milliseconds, drops all activity in cortex. Now, something very different happens during sleep. 
during sleep, the cortex starts to generate intrinsically activity, just low frequency oscillations. And in fact, in this same preparation that was used to, to block the thalamus and see that blocking the thalamus pre prevented uh, activity, activation of cortex during sleep or during this anesthetic state, the cortex continues to generate low frequency activity. And this is very much as, as has been known from in vitro preparations and from deafferented cortical slab preparations and from other work from, from Steriade, but now it's very explicitly shown with optogenetic models. So how do you get these low frequency oscillations? What generates these low, low frequency oscillations? And why do they go away when you're awake? So in that context, I wanted to take you a bit through some work that was done in the Blue Brain Project. Many of you are probably familiar, so I'll go through it quickly. But it was really to see what happens when you put together the pieces of a microcircuit. So this is data that was gathered over 15 years from Henry Markram's lab, um, including single cell gene expression products, single cell morphology reconstructions, electrophysiological data recording from whole, whole cell patch clamp, paired cell reconstructions finding the syn putative synaptic contacts, the synaptic communication between the cells, the overall profile of how many cells are present, how are they connected. So a lot of reverse engineering of this one circuit. And the question was is once you had all that data, how could we put that together to start to understand some principles of what this cortical circuit is doing. And so we established, as many of you are familiar, uh, a process, an iterative process, and it's important just to remember this was a process not to build one circuit, but, but really to, to organize the data, use data-driven model building, simulations, analysis, and validation in an iterative manner to build this model circuit. And a specific data-driven workflow to take the building blocks, identify the volumetric bounds, populate that with the, the building blocks, derive the connectivity, assign the electrical properties, the synaptic properties, and then use that to reconstruct a virtual circuit and a virtual slice. And so we did that with uh, a lot of reconstructed neurons. You see some examples of the interneurons, the diversity of the interneurons from layers one, two, three, four, five, and six in, in somatosensory cortex. This was all based on rat somatosensory cortex at postnatal day 14. And then the excitatory cells, the pyramidal cells, and the spiny stellates uh, from, again, from the rat. We identified the volumetric bounds of the circuit based on the saturation, the local saturation of the dendritic density, and then identified that given the cell de overall cell density, we would have 31,000 cells within this volume a as a kind of a minimal microcircuit. And then we build a microcircuit by populating with those building blocks. So we're positioning the building blocks in the three-dimensional space according to the statistical uh, values identified from electrophysiological experiments. And this builds up a virtual circuit. This creates the, the potential connectivity because you're getting essentially the axons coming close to the dendrite. So this is the biophysical, the physical constraints on connectivity actually. And we use that to then uh, establish later the connectivity, but this is the morphologically reconstructed microcircuit. The, we integrated data about the electrical properties, so 11 electrical types of neuron um, and their mappings to the different morphologies. So each morphology type can have multiple electrical types, and these are the electrical types um, identified, or some of them. And then there's uh, overall the combinations of morphological types and electrical types are the morphoelectric types, and the combinations that were identified from the data was 207 morphoelectric types with different fractions of the electrical types occurring for each morphology. And by assigning those according to their statistics, we get a morphoelectrically reconstructed circuit. And then we had to model the electrical behavior, and again, in a data-driven way, essentially, uh, but using at the core the Hodgkin-Huxley equations for the ion channels, the Rall equations for the passive cable equation, cable properties, 
and then mod capturing the diversity of ion channels that actually go into shaping the, the voltage response. I won't go through all of this in, in very much detail today, but really just to give an idea of, of the types of uh, data that was integrated, the diversity of ion channel models that were used. These, these were from the literature, but we also started a project to get them at large scale under controlled conditions um, from uh, Chinese hamster ovarian cultures. And then data-driven modeling, which starts from the morphologies, uses, uh, uses the information from the gene expression to say which ion channels um, should be present, uses the models of the, the different kinetics of the different classes of ion channels, and then has as an optimization target, so it uses multi-objective optimization to say, here are the features of the electrical behavior that we want to resolve. And then by iterating the distribution of the ion channels on this morphology, you can establish a workflow to build automatically in a data-driven way model neurons. And this basically was used to, to base, based on features of the different electrical types, identifying the, the parameter ranges, integrating any knowledge about uh, ion channel distribution constraints, and then goes through a quality assurance and a generalization process. And we also used that to integrate finer details, for example, the calcium hotspot, backpropagating action potentials, and so on into this, into this model. And this is an example of that. So a, w an, a layer five pyramidal cell that uh, captures the active dendritic properties um, of, of the neurons. And, and we use that to develop basically models for all of the 31,000 cells. Another important aspect of, of integrating data was data about the short-term plasticity and the fact that a single neuron can form. So this pyramidal cell uh, influences this pyramidal cell with a depressing synapse, so the synapse with progressive stimulations becomes weaker, and the interneuron res that receives the input from this cell increases, it's a facilitating response. So a single neuron can produce different short-term plasticity responses postsynaptically, and we mapped that out and captured that for uh, a range of different pathways. And when we put all of that together and run a simulation, of the circuit, well, one of the very basic phenomena that emerged was this low frequency oscillation, similar in some respects to that seen during sleep. And so this is just, uh, uh, again, the frequency is, is intrinsically uh, generated. The properties are emergent. We didn't tune or optimize the model for a network level behavior. This is what emerged from the underlying data. And so that gave us a tool then to, to do some further experiments, building a virtual brain slice and, and enabling additional experiments. We also, um, also were able to instrument local field potential, if I can advance. Oh, I think that the slide needs to be advanced manually. Let's try it again. I think we'll skip that one and continue. So the, the point there was that we were able to um, also calculate the local field potential from the extracellular potential of individual neurons. And by summing that together for all of the different neurons, compute the local field potential. This provides a tool then for interpreting the cellular and synaptic basis of a local field potential and EEG. And I don't know why this um, got so moody, but um, let's hope it, hope it continues. So the que core question that we also had was, we had built this model based on basically in vitro data. So it was data-driven emergent network behavior from in vitro data. And we basically, knew that in vitro, the extracellular calcium concentrations are significantly different than in vivo. 
And so we went through the literature and, and did some measurements as well to find, well, how do the synapses, and especially in terms of the short-term plasticity, the release properties and, the, and, and so on, how, do they, how are they affected by extracellular calcium? Because in vivo, you've got a 1.3 millimolar calcium approximately, and in, vi in vitro, typically experiments are done at two millimolar. And what we found was that the excitatory synapses are affected the most by extracellular calcium, and that when you change the concentration of calcium, you're effectively changing the balance of excitation and inhibition because you're, you're preferentially impacting excitatory pathways. And so by using that information and putting it into the circuit, we actually saw that we changed to a, a very quiet state with some asynchronous activity. And um, that, I think this is not going to advance. Yeah, there's a, there's a problem with the, but, but what that we did is did a search throughout the whole parameter space of calcium concentration and then depolarization, which would be, for example, uh, different concentrations of extracellular potassium, and saw that what you see at a network level is these low-frequency oscillations on the left. So there's this intrinsic propensity to generate low-frequency oscillations in this cortical circuit at these concentrations and this depolarization level. And then there's a fairly abrupt transition where the system basically doesn't generate these low-frequency oscillations but enters into a more asynchronous state, but a lower level activity. So we kind of see a mixture between some of the asynchronous activity that Alain describes, but also quieter states, depending on the level of, of calcium. And we looked uh, experimentally in vitro, and, and so compared to the, sim the simulation here at two millimolar and one millimolar, and then in vitro using a multi-unit array, uh, with on the slice, we could measure at two millimolar calcium and see these very synchronous uh, spikes, and one millimolar seeing the asynchronous state. So this was consistent uh, in vitro as predicted by the simulation. And so what that also showed us, and I'm afraid that now every movie is not going to work. Let me just quickly restart the... Excuse me for a moment. I'll just restart the presentation. And I'll skip ahead. Right. And here, what we see is in the high calcium condition, the in vitro like cal high calcium, we're stimulating with a different number of thalamic fibers. Two fibers, four fibers, eight fibers, 16 and 32. And in this condition, we see that once you hit a threshold of activating, you basically activate the whole circuit. There's this all or nothing response. It produces a traveling wave, an oscillation. In the in vivo condition with lower calcium, you get a very proportional response. So a very direct representation of the amount of input. You get an, an enough recruitment of the inhibitory interneurons to get essentially a very proportional response. So by changing one biophysical parameter, extracellular calcium, you're completely changing the computation performed by the circuit, by the local circuit. And we can characterize that as a, a actually as a spatiotemporal transfer function. Um, and this work, is published uh, a couple years ago and is available. Well, I have to recognize that this is not the work of myself alone. This is 82 authors. This is a large team effort uh, contributing to this. But there is a, um, a portal available where you can go in and, and explore the model and download data and models and, uh, and so on. So I encourage you to look at that. But what we're finding from that model is that we have, a, we have a sufficient basis to understand how dis different cell types, different morphological and electrical p cell types coupled with different short-term plasticity profiles can give rise to this intrinsic oscillation that we know that cortex generates. 
So now if we move up a scale, and now we're actually moving back in time to some modeling work I did much earlier to the blue brain, but we're moving up in scale to the thalamocortical system. And so if we look at the scale that we're talking about, that's about where the, the blue brain microcircuit would fit in scale. It's, it's kind of addressing cortex and about one column of, you know, of what I had assumed in this large scale model. But now we're adding other things. So we're adding a thalamus and a reticular nucleus and layer five through six, layer four, two, three, and then a lot of the details, much less detailed than the blue brain model, but you know, capturing a lot of the microcircuitry of cortex and the orientation selectivity and the, and the horizontal patchy connections between orientation selective responses. And that's for one primary cortical area, and that has the feedback to reticular nucleus and to thalamus. And it's all driven only by visual input. So there's no other input to the system. There's no other noise added. And that's coupled to a secondary cortical area, which has the same structure, but follows the so is driven by the output of layer five, six, um, from to the thalamus of the higher order area. And then there's forward and back propagating uh, projections between the two cortical areas. So this model has about 65,000 cells. It's using integrate and fire spiking neurons, but there's a lot of modeling of the intrinsic currents as well to capture the voltage dependent and independent currents, the intrinsic bursting properties. The synapses uh, only had short-term depression. There wasn't short-term facilitation, but they did capture the dynamics of AMPA and MDA, GABA-A and GABA-B. And the overall anatomy was based on what was known at the time on cat visual thalamocortical circuit and approximately an eight by eight millimeter square of cortex. And then also modeling the diffuse neuromodulatory projections and how they impact channel conductances. And so first of all, we had models of wakefulness and this really captured the spontaneous activity across thalamus, reticular nucleus, three layers of cortex here kind of merged together. Um, and if you look at the single cell level, you see highly irregular firing, low, low level firing spontaneously for excitatory cells and higher frequency firing for inhibitory and a, and a low amplitude, uh, high frequency fluctuation in the local field potential. And then some volt this is averaged uh, voltage activity for just to kind of show the topographical organization. Now, when you present a stimulus, you get an evoked response, a strong evoked response. In this case, this was a moving grating, a vertical moving grating. And, um, and during that response, you get actually strong onset responses from the, the two cell types. You get adaptation in the excitatory cells, but not in the fast spiking. And you get a gamma frequency oscillation that wasn't built into the model, but basically you'll see that in a moment that occurs throughout the duration of the stimulation. And then again, the, the selective response, the vertical uh, cells are responding to the vertical grading, but the horizontal cells are somewhat suppressed. And so if we take a look at that as a, as a movie, um, we can see the thalamus, and the thalamus is really receiving the input from the optic nerve to drive this. That created the spontaneous activity. Now the vertical grading is present. You're seeing a flickering. Um, that's the gamma frequency oscillation. And then when you remove the stimulus, it kind of resumes to the to spontaneous activity, again, driven by the thalamus. If I were to cut off that thalamic input, the whole circuit would be silent. So if I show that to you maybe in a slightly different view, um, and with a, this is the spontaneous activity, if I can, again, thalamus, reticular nucleus, the different layers of cortex, and, and here we have layer two, three of the vertically selective cells and layer two, three of the horizontally selective cells. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see the trend, the, the, those populations in the spontaneous activity are really reflecting their selectivity properties. They're reflecting the, func the, the functional architecture um, in that spontaneous activity. And then if we go to uh, another type of stimulation, say a plaid stimulation in the thalamus, you can see the activation of the vertically selective and the horizontally selective 
horizontally selective independently, right? So the, the architecture during wakefulness is acting to be selective to different components, different features of the visual stimulation. So we think that that was a reasonable first step in capturing some key properties of wakefulness, right? The spontaneous ongoing activity, the irregular firing, the response to stimuli, the, the evoked uh, onset response, the actually the inhibitory offset response, the gamma frequency oscillations, kind of was a reasonable approximation of uh, visual wakefulness or responses during visual wakefulness. But the question was is, can we take that same circuit and actually have it go to sleep? So can we, and I have four minutes left, um, can we remove the, simulate the removal of neuromodulators and transition the system to uh, sleep? And so th from the literature, we identified changes in the conductances of ion channels and synaptic receptors, implemented those changes, and we see that the system goes from the spontaneous activity to a period of generating these low frequency oscillations. Now this was something that in this case, in contrary to the blue brain case, this had to be carefully engineered and was tuned for many years in order to produce the data. Whereas in the blue brain, it was a phenomena that emerged from the underlying data. Uh, the single cell activity and then the local field potential. And if we look at that, sorry. You can see then the thalamus, the reticular nucleus, three layers of cortex and um, as we're transitioning to sleep from this spontaneous wakefulness, the whole system becomes quite quiet until the low frequency oscillation, these, the upstate is triggered from the intrinsic firing of layer five cells and, and other intrinsic currents. And it basically is spread through the cortico-cortical connectivity and through the buildup of potassium currents and synaptic depression, the upstate is terminated and, it's, and the network enters a dysfus a disfacilitated state. And that generates, will basically generate the low frequency oscillation, the slow oscillation for a long time. So just to show you quickly, this is a kind of a zoom in on just cortex and just to show you the, the generation of those os oscillations. And what happens to when, and this is a really old movie that I found, but it shows then how the selectivity and the and the responses are, are destroyed, are interfered with by the slow oscillation. So um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip ahead very quickly, just to say that you know, we, we do have an opportunity and there is an important piece of knowledge that we have about the relationship of being conscious to sleep. And we know about, for example, when you're conscious, there is we, plasticity, and in the case of some anesthetics, you can have consciousness without plasticity, but for the most part, when you're a conscious, you've got plasticity. Now, when you've got plasticity, that actually increases synaptic strength. The, there's a lot of evidence for a gradually increased excitability throughout the day from, from prior activity. And, and this data shows that there are local increases in local sleep at night after a learning task. If, uh, so if you, uh, you have an arm learning a, co a coordinate transformation, this right parietal area increases the slow wave activity at night. If you immobilize that area, you don't get that increase. In fact, you see a suppression of local sleep. Now, th the same model that I showed you was used to show and to, and to make predictions about the changes in the EEG morphology uh, due to changes in cortical cortical connectivity. So it does provide a tool for exploring the, the relationship between synaptic plasticity at the cortical level and the EEG um, at a higher level. Now, I have 57 seconds, and I was just gonna tell you all about what we're doing with this in Canada. Um, just to say that we're you know, basically starting a new center in the context of Canada's largest mental health hospital. And uh, the patient populations that we're dealing with are really 30% in substance use, 30% in schizophrenic and psychotic, and 30% in mood disorders. And just to make one quick final point, because 
this will be key to what we're, we're using, is that virtually all neurological, psychiatric, and substance abuse disorders are associated with sleep, sleep disruptions. So we see changes in and disturbances in sleep. And we're going to use sleep as a tool to link to cellular and synaptic mechanisms. And, um, and there's a, you know, more that I could talk about there, but I'm afraid my time is up. Um, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. So we have one question in the front, Rodolfo. Have you considered Q10 in your model? Have you considered Q10 in your model? So it's a very important point. In, in which model? So in, in this model, in not. In general. No. In and yeah, I mean, we, we, we know we're aware, and we're going beyond Q10 in the sense of measuring specific changes to ch ion channels at very different, because Q10 doesn't necessarily fit no, no, but, it, it but, but yes, it's, we're considering it's such temperature. It's an important issue for you. It's and a for fundamental all of us. issue, and it, with with the current models, it's not well, it's not well captured. Actually, um, we know, you know, in our new data that we're getting from the Ion Channel Project, we do know a lot more about uh, changes to the channels. But so far, in fact, I don't think we're really doing justice to the true diversity of ion channels and the ways in which they can act in concert. So, so your kinetics assume what sort of basic tem temperature? There was, th there was basically, um, you know, room temperature. So room temperature? Yeah. yeah. You know for, that for room a, for temperature a things, things don't work so I well, right? I agree. Okay. I agree. I agree. No, I think there's a, lot, there's a lot to be improved there. Hi, Sohan. So thank you. I'm at Look to your left. <laughs> okay. Um, so look, the, the first part of your talk, you look really at the sort of data-driven modeling approach of right. the Blue Brain project, right? And after all these years of effort, and actually, Henry promised us that by 2020, there'll be a whole brain following this approach, right? Let's not forget that. But after all this effort, you show us, okay, we have a, a very complex model, which is about as complex as the brain that we try to understand, and we're able to make it oscillate at some low frequency. So isn't that actually showing that that whole approach is not really helping us understand the brain? Because compared to Peter Rufsema's model, right, he, has, he explains data, right, that actually with a very minimal model that allows us to get a handle on principles, right? So, so isn't this illustration showing that this whole bottom-up, so data-driven yeah. approach is just not working? So, so actually, uh, it, it doesn't. This talk, I say, doesn't give due justice to the insights and the principles that have been found from that model. So that's, that's another talk. But I where can I find them? Well, I, I've, I've given this uh, talk uh, many times, but I would, I mean, the paper is also there. I read it, um, not there. Uh, I'll sit down with you afterwards and take you through uh, it. That's not enough. <laughs> All right. But look, I mean, th there's a lot of fundamental principles in terms of connectivity, about the basis of connectivity, about the dynamics, about the uh, structural to functional, and, and prin fundamental principles that have come out of that work. Okay. And, um, and the fact is, is that, you know, th there are multiple approaches, as I showed you today. I mean, you can also go into the literature and spend, you know, I spent five six years reading thousands of papers and integrating it into a, thal a thalamocortical model by hand. But that's a piece, in my mind, of art and not something sustainable that you can integrate new data into. And I think that's why the Blue Brain Project is so fundamentally important. We need a biological, we need a scaffold into which we can integrate biophysical measurements and understand their relationship to network activity. And that, without that, I'm sorry, but we, we can't make the fundamental links that we need for medicine. So, uh, yes, I, I, I think you guys should go together at the, at the <laughs> <break>. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. <laughs> uh, last question uh, here, please. Yes, uh, well, first, beautiful work. Uh, I, I wanted to make one comment on the uh, dependency with the uh, extracellular calcium. Uh, I mean, there's the beautiful work of uh, Bob Singer's group in the, uh, well, I don't know, 20 years ago uh, concerning uh, the threshold of plasticity and it's linked with critical values of uh, calcium. So 
are, are, you, are you not tempted to revise the uh, STDP theory and uh, redo uh, all the, the STDP uh, uh, well, uh, relation with uh, extracellular calcium because it, it may lead to very different outcomes. Yeah, so, so I think that's an extremely important point. I think the STDP as it has been kind of widely understood is really one snapshot of a much more dynamic process that has a lot more dependencies on calcium, it has a lot more dependencies on the, the state of the synapse with short-term plasticity. So it's really not capturing the true you know, full nature of plasticity. And I think you, know, you will see some papers coming out soon that take that in a, in a deeper direction. Okay, thank you again, Sean. Yeah. The next speaker is uh, Fabrice Wendling and he's um, involved in a type of modeling which is uh, close to uh, and, and very strongly constrained by the electroencephalogram and um, where the goal is to model the different brain states uh, up to consciousness and uh, as well as uh, pathological conditions like epilepsy has uh, some nice contributions there. And uh, he's uh, basically research director at the INSERM, which is the funding body in France for ev every biomedical uh, science, uh, especially clinical. And um, this since uh, about 20 years now. So uh, he's... I will read the title while it's, it's going to be shown. Physiological modeling of consciousness from microcircuits to awareness and wakefulness. By the way, I can take this opportunity to, for the speakers of the rest of the conference, if you can, please upload your presentation on the back because it's much faster and, they, and we avoid uh, problems of connections with the computer. So thanks a lot uh, for, uh, for the introduction. Uh, and also, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. So, uh, my talk will also be on, uh, on models uh, at a different uh, level from uh, uh, models uh, shown by the, the, the previous speaker. Uh, and uh, today, what I would like to show is how, f I mean, models uh, inspired from physiology may help us, in fact, to, uh, to, to better understand uh, con consciousness and uh, typically, I mean, the two dimensions of consciousness, which are awareness and, and wakefulness. So this uh, work is performed in the context of a European project called uh, Luminous. Our vision is that uh, consciousness will uh, someday be electromagnetically measured and altered. And, uh, I'm sure that we all agree that the insights will be crucial for the development of cognitive neuroscience. So the questions we address in this project is how can we measure consciousness and uh, can it be altered through uh, electromagnetic brain stimulation? So the one objective of the project is also to advance uh, methods and technologies. So uh, not only we measure uh, I mean, brain activity from different modalities, EEG, MEG, uh, fMRI, under spontaneous and evoked condition, but we also, in fact, develop methods to alterate brain activity, uh, typically through uh, non-invasive brain stimulation. This project is organized around uh, three main work packages. One is devoted to uh, science and theory. Uh, another one is uh, dedicated to uh, technological developments. And of course, there are many experiments conducted in normal subjects, but also in patients in this uh, project. So this modeling work is part of the first work package, 
uh, in the scientific framework. There are several objectives. We would like to provide a theoretical framework for, for consciousness, for modeling, and also for uh, defining metrics of consciousness. We want to uh, develop novel metrics of consciousness uh, combined uh, with uh, stimulation. And also, uh, and this will be the, 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 the main topic uh, for my talk today, we would like to develop a, a physiologically relevant computational brain model that would bridge between electroencephalography, non-invasive brain stimulation, and uh, consciousness uh, matrix. So, uh, as we saw, I mean, these two days, uh, a number of uh, theories of consciousness have been uh, proposed so far. The dynamic core hypothesis, the global workspace theory, the in in integrated uh, information theory. There are, these theories are different, but they share some uh, uh, common aspects. Uh, we are talking about information processing in the brain, distributed neural activity. They talk about connectivity in the brain and the role of thalamocortical circuits and also uh, the, the, the importance of brain oscillations. Another consideration is that uh, we have accumulated so far a huge amount of data regarding the, the mechanisms which underlie the, the generation of uh, brain activity. And to, uh, to some extent also, we know better now the, the, the biophysics of uh, EEG generation and also the impact of uh, non-invasive brain stimulation is now uh, better understood. So to us, a progress beyond the state of the art would be to combine, in fact, the knowledge we gain from uh, these theories of consciousness, of course, from uh, the neuroscience literature about uh, brain activity, and also, I mean, the work that is uh, done uh, in the simulation of EEG and the simulation of electric fields uh, induced by uh, non-invasive brain stimulation. So, our objective is uh, to develop a model which can be viewed as an, an integrative framework that would, that would bridge between uh, brain uh, circuits at micro and macro uh, level to EEG, EEG that is, uh, on the other hand, associated with uh, states of consciousness. So this is the roadmap that we have defined for the next, uh, for, the, for the four years duration of the, of the project. First, uh, we identified some key mechanisms that we felt very uh, important for uh, the development of the model. Then we have defined a modeling framework, which is different from uh, the, the, the microscopic uh, level. Here, we will develop uh, neural mass models that are specifically adapted to the cytoarchitecture of uh, the cortex and the thalamus. We are currently uh, uh, involved in uh, the, 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 the implementation and simulation of, of the model. And of course, I mean, evaluation and validation is an important issue. So we are now, see, com uh, now also comparing, in fact, the simulation results with uh, actual EEG data. And I will show some results uh, about the simulation of TMS-induced responses and uh, related to the, the a, a matrix of, uh, of uh, consciousness, which is uh, the perturbational complexity index. So for the, uh, th this, uh, this roadmap will also be the outline of the, of the talk. So for the key mechanisms, uh, we know that there are two dimensions of consciousness. One is more the awareness, the content of consciousness, and the other dimension is wakefulness, the level of consciousness. So awareness has been uh, shown to be mainly associated with uh, cortico-cortical, uh, let's say, horizontal uh, connectivity. And there are uh, papers showing that uh, awareness requires the activation of large-scale, let's say, cortico-frontoparietal uh, networks. On the other hand, uh, wakefulness is associated more to uh, thalamocortical, vertical connectivity. And we know, for instance, that uh, the, the thalamocortical circuits uh, are involved uh, in, uh, during, uh, during uh, the, the sleep uh, state. So there are also two mechanisms uh, which uh, seem to us very important to integrate in the model. One is the gating by, uh, by inhibition. In fact, information uh, routing in the brain is controlled by the magnitude 
of uh, local inhibition, which is uh, uh, and reported as uh, being reflected in the, by the reduction of alpha activity. Another mechanism, which is also important uh, for uh, brain activity, uh, refers to uh, CTC. CTC means communication through coherence. And according to this mechanism, I mean, uh, information transfer in the brain is controlled by the phase relationship between oscillations, mostly in the, in the gamma uh, frequency band. So these are the three mechanisms that uh, we retain for the model. For the uh, modeling framework, we uh, chose uh, the neural mass level modeling. So as you probably know, uh, this is a, a mesoscopic uh, level of modeling. It's not mic macro, it's not uh, macroscopic, it's in between. And typically we, considered in f we consider in fact in this type of models a population of networks that involve uh, pyramidal cells and, and interneurons. There are two main mathematical functions that uh, govern in fact the dynamics of this uh, small neuronal population. One has been uh, named by uh, Walter Freeman as the pulse to wave. So it's basically the transformation of afferent action potentials into a postsynaptic activity. So the pulse to wave function, uh, this one is uh, linear. And there is another uh, nonlinear function, a sigmoid uh, type function, which uh, transforms in fact the postsynaptic activity into uh, a density of uh, action potential. So we recently, with Fernando Lopez da Silva, wrote a, a chapter for uh, the new edition of uh, the, the, the uh, EEG handbook. And uh, we, we made a, a very didactical, in fact, uh, section on this uh, type of models. So these are fairly simple models, in fact. Uh, it's very easy from these uh, small uh, schematic diagrams to go to a, a block diagram, derive the, the equation, typically, we only have a, a few number of equations, uh, six to 10 equations per uh, neuronal population. And a nice uh, feature of this model is that the output corresponds to the summation of uh, excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. And we know that this summation is the main contribution to uh, the local field potentials. And these models are very well known to uh, simulate uh, alpha uh, activity. So LFP is in the alpha band. Uh, from uh, 8 to, to 12 hertz. What we did in the project is that we went from generic to more specific uh, models. So we extended, in fact, the generic neuronal population to uh, a specific uh, model that now includes uh, a diversity of uh, GABAergic interneurons. We have uh, basket cells, uh, uh, somatostatin uh, positive cells, some plus, some plus uh, uh, cells and also uh, vasointestinal peptide positive uh, cells. And uh, I mean, from the literature, we could in fact identify the, the, the connectivity patterns uh, among the, the pyramidal cells and the GABAergic interneurons. So uh, thanks to this uh, extension, uh, we uh, could very nicely simulate uh, gamma activity, uh, which occurs mainly in the loop uh, the, the, the fast inhibitory uh, feedback loop between uh, basket cells and, uh, and uh, pyramidal cells. So uh, for the gating by inhibition, uh, we could also reproduce, in fact, the switch from uh, alpha to, uh, to gamma activity. So typically, I mean, alpha activity is uh, being generated in this uh, small circuit, pyramidal cell, somatostatin, basket cell. But when we have external uh, projection of, uh, let's say, another neuronal population, pyramidal cells to uh, uh, VIP uh, interneurons, they inhibit the somatostatin and then remove uh, the inhibition of uh, basket cell. And, uh, and then uh, we switch, we have the switch, in fact, the model nicely reproduces the switch from uh, alpha to, uh, to gamma uh, activity. So we also uh, verified that, uh, I mean, we, we can uh, assess this uh, communica communication through coherence uh, process. So when we have uncoupled uh, uh, cortical populations, uh, we have a very low uh, coherence, in fact, from uh, between the LFPs generated by the two uh, neuronal populations. In contrast, 
when we now uh, include some uh, connections between uh, the, the, the normal populations, then we observe not only an increase of the alpha power, but also a nice increase uh, of the coherence, the synchrony between the, uh, the gamma oscillations. So we have developed a, a graphical user interface in the context of this uh, project. We may instantiate, we may create as many uh, populations as uh, we want. This is an example of the, uh, a, a cortical uh, neuronal population. So we can, uh, in fact, uh, let's say, uh, change the parameters associated with uh, local interneurons. And, uh, and also, uh, we can uh, now couple, in fact, the, uh, the, the, the neuronal populations uh, through uh, excitatory connections, so pyramid to pyramid. But we have also introduced now uh, connections from pyramidal cells to uh, some plus uh, interneurons, and also from pyramidal cells to uh, VIP uh, interneurons. So it's a bit more complicated now because not only we have, uh, let's say, collateral excitation uh, among uh, the, 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 the various cortical populations, but we also have uh, connectivity matrices now uh, to account for uh, excitatory connections onto uh, local uh, inhibitory interneurons. Uh, so this was for the horizontal connectivity for the vertical connectivity, uh, we also uh, made a, a neural mass model for the, the thalamus, and also uh, through uh, the management of uh, connectivity uh, matrices, we have connected this uh, neural mass to uh, cortical populations. So we have connections from uh, thalamocortical cells onto pyramidal cells, but we also have feed-forward inhibition from uh, TC cells onto uh, GABAergic interneurons, and of course, pyramidal cells in turn uh, excite uh, the reticular uh, nucleus uh, cells in the thalamus. So we could, uh, uh, with this model, uh, very nicely uh, reproduce the dynamics of, uh, of uh, EEG activity. So we have uh, the alpha uh, activity. We can reproduce the, the theta rhythm observed in the EEG. Uh, for some parameter tuning, uh, we also have the K uh, complexes. And uh, when we also, uh, and I will show how, when we also tune the parameters, the model nicely also uh, reproduces the, the slow waves uh, that are uh, observed during uh, deep sleep. So how do we uh, get, in fact, uh, these uh, various uh, rhythms? Just by playing, in fact, by the, uh, just by, by tuning, in fact, uh, the cortico-cortical and thalamocortical connectivity in the, in the model. Typically, when we uh, decrease, uh, gradually decrease cortico-cortical connections and progressively increase uh, the thalamocortical uh, connectivity, we go from uh, alpha to uh, slow wave uh, activity. So, uh, the key features of the EEG model are uh, the, the following. We have made a, a large scale uh, model. So uh, we have defined uh, a number of uh, cortical patches uh, plus the, the, the thalamus. Uh, this model, in fact, may reproduce, as I've just shown, uh, different states of consciousness based on the cortico thalamo cortical connectivity. And uh, as I will show, uh, we can generate with this model uh, EEG, but also account for non-invasive brain stimulation effects. So how do we get from uh, cortical sources to scalp EEG? So based on a, a parcellation of the uh, neocortex, we uh, have one neural mass per uh, cortical patch. So we also have, of course, uh, the temporal dynamics associated to each uh, cortical source. And we know that uh, from a, a head model, which provides us with the, the volume conductor and the position of sensors, it's relatively easy, in fact, to get the lead field matrix. So the contribution of each source on uh, uh, all electrodes uh, position on the scalp. So we can, in fact, get uh, an EEG. So for that part, in fact, we uh, took advantage of uh, some work that we've done 
in the previous uh, future on emerging uh, technology project, the Hive project, in which we defined a complete pipeline, in fact, to, uh, to go from uh, uh, cortical uh, sources to, uh, to EG. And uh, the, the unique feature of this pipeline is that we can also account for uh, the distribution of electric fields as induced by uh, transcranial current uh, stimulation or transcranial uh, magnetic uh, stimulation. So since we have uh, populations of neurons, since we can model the distribution of the electric field in the brain, we uh, found a way, in fact, to, uh, let's say, to account for the impact of the electric field at the level of each neuronal population. And uh, I'm using the same equation, uh, cortical dynamics times uh, lead field matrix, we can simulate uh, EEGs. So this is just a, an example. Uh, we chose, uh, I mean, a few channels of EEG uh, in the context of uh, alpha activity. This is just to show you that uh, these models are very, very uh, uh, fast, in fact, to simulate. They do not require high uh, computation time. And uh, if I said real time here, it's just because, in fact, to get one second of uh, EEG, on a number of 100 or 200 channels, it takes one second uh, simulation. So I would like to, uh, to, uh, to finish this, uh, this talk, in fact, by uh, evaluation and uh, validation. Uh, we uh, all know that uh, this is uh, important because not only modelers uh, have to develop uh, models that uh, can uh, reproduce uh, observed phenomena, but uh, what we also expect is that we can also make predictions from, uh, from models. Nevertheless, the very first step, in fact, is uh, to, to evaluate and validate a, a model is to confront, in fact, uh, the, the, the simulations with uh, the actual data. So uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, it's not uh, published yet. But uh, we uh, thought that uh, a first step for evaluation would be, in fact, to, uh, to investigate the relationship between cortico-cortical, thalamocortical connectivity and uh, some uh, consciousness uh, uh, metrics. So we uh, simulated, in fact, uh, EEG for two different states of uh, thalamocortical connectivity. One state is, uh, let's say, normal, quote, normal, uh, uh, projection from uh, TC cells to uh, pyramidal cells, so normal feed forward in inhibition onto the, the cortex. And a second uh, condition would be uh, an increased, in fact, input from uh, TC cells uh, onto uh, pyramidal cells and also uh, increased uh, feed forward inhibition as uh, TC cells uh, project also to basket cells and uh, somatostatin positive uh, 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 GABAergic interneurons. So for each condition, in fact, we computed uh, the Lampel-Ziv uh, complexity. Uh, as a first approximation, LZ is uh, very similar to the perturbational complexity index uh, introduced by uh, Marcello, Massimini, and, and colleagues. And uh, this was computed, in fact, from uh, the thresholded uh, binarized activity matrix of uh, TMS-evoked uh, responses. So this is... Uh, an example of, of simulation. Uh, here we, we only show uh, three uh, sources in the, in the cortex. These are the TMS pulses. So uh, for each uh, pulse, we can uh, simulate a high resolution EEG. This is a, a 256 uh, channel EEG. Of course, I mean, from this EEG, we can solve the inverse problem and look at uh, uh, the activity at the level of the cortex as estimated from uh, the scalp EEG. So this is what, uh, what, uh, what we get, which is a bit similar to what uh, Marcello has shown uh, yesterday. So for each pulse, we have an activation, in fact, of uh, the network, the large scale network in the, in, the, in the cortex. Then from the EEG, we can, of course, compute. Uh, so the EEG may be uh, simulated for different states, uh, the awake state, uh, the, the sleep state and we can compute uh, matri ma matrix of, uh, of consciousness, such as the Lampel-Ziv or the PCI. 
So for the normal uh, thalamocortical connectivity, the awake state, in fact, so we solve the g 4 solution uh, with thresholded and binarized uh, the, the responses. This is what, uh, what we get. And then we computed the LZ uh, complexity and uh, we compared, in fact, to uh, the paper uh, recently published by uh, Casali et al. Uh, and as you can see, in fact, we have very similar, in fact, uh, uh, I mean, the simulations look very similar to uh, the actual responses uh, obtained by the, uh, by the authors. For the second condition, uh, when we have increased uh, thalamocortical connectivity that mimics, uh, I mean, the slow wave and the sleep, uh, the sleep activity, so when we do the exact uh, same uh, operations, then we have uh, a response, a binarized uh, thresholded response that is completely different with, of course, a, a much lower uh, LZ uh, complexity index. We go from 0.1 to uh, 0.01. And, uh, of course, uh, we also have a very similar uh, image uh, compared to uh, what was uh, reported in the, in the literature. So, this, uh, uh, in fact, uh, first results, which are, which are preliminary results, uh, show that uh, with the model, we, uh, we are now on the, on, the, on the way of bridging between brain circuits, uh, cortico-cortical, thalamocortical, uh, so large-scale circuits, but also, I mean, uh, micro-circuits because we also included in the model the, the connectivity within uh, neuronal populations, so bridge between brain circuits, uh, TMS evoked responses, and uh, metrics, metrics of uh, consciousness, uh, typically uh, the complexity uh, indexes. So, as a, as a summary, uh, I mean, uh, our mission in the, in the Luminous project is to provide a, a computational model of brain activity. We would like this model, in fact, to be able to uh, simulate EEG, in fact, for various uh, states, brain states, and uh, we pay a lot of attention, in fact, uh, for uh, those uh, simulated EEG to compare with uh, real uh, EEG data. So uh, by modifying the, the model parameters, we would like to simulate various uh, states, for example, sleep and awake. And for those uh, various states, get, uh, uh, let's say, realistic uh, EEG uh, signals. And uh, what uh, we also want to do is to uh, identify some parameters related to non-invasive brain stimulation, which may, uh, in fact, uh, provide us with uh, predictions about uh, which parameters should be changed by NIBS in order to induce some, let's say, changes uh, in, uh, in brain uh, states. Can we, for instance, go from sleep to, uh, to the awake states? And uh, since we have uh, EEG data, uh, then uh, we can compute uh, metrics, indexes for measuring consciousness. So far, we have chosen a number of, uh, of metrics to, uh, to evaluate. Uh, the phi uh, index in the, in the IIT, the perturbational complexity index, uh, the Kolmogorov algorithmic complexity, uh, we also work on functional and effective connectivity estimated from uh, dense EEG data and also some scale-free uh, approaches. And uh, what we think is that uh, this computational model may be a way, in fact, uh, to, uh, to close the loop, I would say, to go from uh, metrics of consciousness to uh, specific parameters in the model, synaptic transmission, uh, connectivity, and uh, we may, in fact, uh, uh, let's say, uh, get some insights about uh, the information that is conveyed by uh, these various uh, metrics of consciousness and, uh, and see uh, also, assess the differences, in fact, uh, in, the, in the information they, uh, they provide. So establish a link between what we measure from the EEG and uh, the physiologically uh, relevant parameters in the, in the model. 
So uh, I thank you for your attention. Before uh, uh, I, I finish, I would like to acknowledge, in fact, the, the people involved in this uh, luminous uh, project. First, the people from uh, Starlab, Aurélie uh, Soria Frisch and uh, Giulio Ruffini. Starlab is, uh, is, a, is a small uh, company, in fact, uh, located in Barcelona. Uh, my colleagues uh, from uh, Liège, uh, Stephen Lawrence and, and collaborators from the Coma Science Group, Marcello Massimini from uh, Milano, and also uh, Irene Tracy from Oxford, and uh, there are three German groups also involved in the project. Michael Nietzsche, who is a, an expert in, the, in transcranial direct current stimulation, and also the people from Tübingen and, and, uh, and, uh, and Munich. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for questions. Yes. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, now, of course, there is uh, control by neuromodulation of the different states. Um, uh, you introduced the uh, uh, hierarchy of uh, inhibitory <coughs> neuron in the cerebral cortex. And uh, uh, very interestingly, we have been very much concerned by that because the nicotinic receptors, uh, as you may know, are present only on, uh, at least in layer two, three, on the inhibitory neuron and not on the pyramidal cells. So it uh, could be a clue to, yes, that's uh, uh, this uh, kind of scheme uh, have been further developed and documented, as you may have seen in Nature Medicine. So, yes, uh, what is your the paper. Uh, reaction yeah. to that? So, it was not a question, it was a comment. The question is, yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you account for uh, the neuromodulation of the conscious states because they are under <coughs> neuromodulatory control, of course, as you know, acetylcholine is promoting uh, wakefulness and uh, so on. So we have not inclu included the, the nicotinic uh, receptors in the, in the model. I mean, it's only... Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's not uh, accounted for, I mean, at the, at the present time. No, we do not have... Uh, I mean, in terms of neurotransmitters, uh, what we have is just uh, glutamate and, uh, and, and GABA. And uh, why? And because it's, I mean, we have now a, a local uh, nonlinear non dynamic uh, system that is able, in fact, to generate all these rhythms, okay, that we have in, I mean, awake to, uh, to sleep. Uh, just by including these, uh, these simple uh, elements. We have, to some extent, we have the, 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 the sufficient uh, ingredients to, uh, to generate the rhythms that, uh, that uh, we needed. It's the story of, uh, I mean, making the, the, the model as simple as possible, but not too simple. Uh, it's a little bit too. <coughs> okay. <coughs> it, it's, uh, it's not only you, it's a general comment, but w when you talk about a matrix of consciousness, so it's not a matrix of consciousness, it's a matrix of the condi condition of yeah. the consciousness. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have any meaning, uh, any information? It's, it's a shortcut, it's a shortcut, uh, I agree. I, I I'm think a, that a this shortcut is a... It's a shortcut. It's all time in all the talk here, yeah, and I think I it's, it's a I'm, I'm a signal processing guy, so no, no. I, I agree. What we compute uh, are quantities that are computed from EEG, and uh, EEG relates to uh, some states in the brain, uh, so the, we, we make a shortcut, in fact. Uh, signal processing quantities are matrix, and uh, you know, so in fact, yes, this terminology is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, confusing. I agree. I, I do have a, quest a question. Yeah. Is that there is a, uh, not a project uh, which is European and American, uh, which is called the Virtual Brain, which is uh, uh, head, headed uh, in part by uh, Victor Girsa. Yeah. And there is a lot of common points that I see I by listening to I your know. talk and the talk of Victor. 
Is, yeah. is there any plan of integrating yes. your efforts? We have a meeting, in fact, early uh, September, in fact, in Washington, D.C. Okay, uh, very to good. To see yeah. if we can join uh, the efforts. Because the Virtual Brain Project, in fact, has, uh, has made a lot of progress on uh, the structural connectivity of the brain, based on uh, tensor imaging and uh, DTI and MRI. And, uh, but at the level of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, cortical activity or thalamocortical circuits, it's probably less uh, advanced uh, in terms of uh, uh, inspiration from uh, physiology than those models. So we, mm -hmm. we can probably join our efforts and uh, use, I mean, these more sophisticated neural mass uh, models that we have developed uh, and incorporate them into the, the virtual brain yeah. for at the end having the, the a, I think an even more realistic the model. The way it is built, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, put any model, yeah. I think, in the virtual brain, I, I, at least in one of the further versions. Uh, so it's I going to be uh, I should easy mention to that do, we I will think, yeah. probably start uh, in the context of epilepsy. I mean, yeah. to, to join these, uh, these efforts. So we are going to move to the general discussion. And so I will ask all the speakers of this morning to come. So maybe we should just uh, go there, yes. Yeah, so we are going to limit the general discussion to 15 minutes uh, to absorb the delay that we have accumulated this morning. All right, so um, we'll have uh, at least a bit of time for general discussion. Um, let's see if there are questions. I, I might start with um, asking, as, as the session is very much about modeling uh, emulation in relation to consciousness, um, <coughs> we've seen various approaches, also the neural dynamics uh, or the more uh, physics-based abstract approach towards inference and perception. Uh, presented by uh, Carl Friston. Um, <coughs> so maybe we, we first get back to the question uh, to Carl in this case, um, where uh, the difference lies, uh, you think, between uh, conscious, conscious inference and, and non-conscious uh, inference processes. Uh, for instance, yeah, related to cerebellar internal models or uh, related internal models. Could you comment on that? Yes, so that was part two of my presentation. Oh, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you <laughs> still have a chance to summarize. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Ah, <laughs> right. Um, I was just saying that it uh, also speaks to the last question about the difference between the cerebellum and the, the uh, cerebral cortex. The, the answer that I would have developed would be that if there is self-evidencing underneath all conscious processing, then what is special about consciousness as we know and love it? Um, it, it must be an attribute of the generative model, and in particular, the beliefs about what I'm going to do and the story would be that um, it is sufficient to believe that you exist and that in existing you're going to minimize your expected free energy, which means you're going to resolve uncertainty um, so that you then get into an active sensing or active inference um, model of the world where you, compl you select your actions. And I think the, the notion of selecting an action suddenly comes to the fore, and that's going to be one aspect of conscious inference. Hmm. Um, on the basis of those actions that, going, that are going to resolve as much uncertainty as possible, given the uh, hypotheses you entertain about the current context in which you're operating. Hmm. And what that brings to the table is the notion of a, a temporal depth, a horizon, um, and technically it, it, it brings us to the path of a time interval from the variational point of view, but more intuitively, what it says is that systems that appear to operate under 
generative models or forward models of their world that have temporal thickness or temporal depth will uniquely discriminate themselves and look as if they are conscious in the sense, I think, that we're talking, uh, we're talking about it. So that says that things like the cerebellum, which don't have much temporal depth, they're really good for very, very short-term mm. um, uh, forward modeling over several hundred milliseconds, would not be in the game of consciousness as we know it, whereas other bits of the brain that could have delay period activity over several seconds would be. Mm. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, we have a question here. Please go ahead. Yes, hello. Hi, Carl. I have a question for you. Um, and it comes after the, um, the, the point that you made that consciousness for you is a process, and this uh, finds me, I agree with a lot. And I was thinking that self is also a process. And I would like uh, to know for you whether there is a difference between the two. And if there is, where would you spot that? So um, that would be, you know, the, the part three, which, which <laughs> wasn't even on my slides. Uh, so self-modeling, so what I was just talking about the sorts of generative models that would be, uh, you, would as you would equip a conscious artifact with to make it conscious in, in a sort of elemental sense. The next move would be self-awareness. Um, then that necessarily <coughs> entails a generative model that d can discriminate or have hypotheses that I am a self in relation to not being a self or not self or other. So then you have to think about the sorts of evidence that underpin and license a hypothesis that I am a creature as distinct from you. And then I think we get into all sorts of interesting stories about interceptive inference on the one hand, a sort of an embodied perspective on self-modeling. And on the other hand, I think what Will Singer was speaking to yesterday, the only rationale for having a hypothesis that there are I am a creature like me is if there are other creatures like me out there that make my universe. So then we have this sort of social neuroscience um, perspective and the, um, the importance of having other creatures like me in my world that makes it necessary or allowable, licensed me to have the hypothesis that I am also a creature like this. C does anybody know where the word consciousness comes from? The Greek? Mm. Conscier in Latin? Uh, yeah, is it Latin, right. is it? Conscier. Kn knowing together or knowing yeah. with. Yeah. So I think that knowing together speaks to that really high level um, uh, thing that I, you know, I think that Wolf was alluding to, and I think your question is also alluding to, that you know, self in relation to, to others is, is, a, is a key aspect of those particular uh, sorts of genetic models. Right, I think we have a question here. Um, Yeah, so following on from this idea about temporal depth, um, have any of the modelers thought about including neuro neurobiological uh, processes that might mediate slower processes like astrocytes, for example, beyond neurons? Yeah. Um, this is a question for anybody in particular. Anyone who's doing modeling, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Sean, you want to start, or Alan? Sure. I mean, so of course there's. There are a number of known Im important relationships between astrocytes and neurons, and, and there, are, you know, we do have some projects underway to model uh, the relationship between a single neuron, uh, its associated astrocytes, and and a small section of vascular vasculature, and um, but primarily at this stage, kind of from an energetics perspective, and that does require simulating a lot of the the geometry of the extracellular space and doing reconstructions from EM data. And then it requires a different level of modeling and simulation in order to, to capture the reaction diffusion coupled with the electrical properties. Um, but I think it's important to, you know, again, in terms of bridging scales, it's important to look for principles there that we can then, you know, develop models that will help us uh, extrapolate and move across to, to other scales. Right. Hello? I, I would like just to add that we have uh, in, the, in the theory part of the Human Brain Project uh, several people involved in modeling uh, glial activity. And the goal is to generate from a detailed model a, mod a simplified 
uh, model that can be in incorporated in standard uh, network simulation in order to take into account of uh, effects due to glia. For example, uh, one uh, known example is the tripartite synapse, where there is uh, uh, not only postsynaptic and presynaptic elements, but there is also a glial uh, partner. And, uh, and maybe in the, in the, in the synaptic rule uh, or the plasticity rule, for example, that is used, one can incorporate uh, a term or two terms or whatever that accounts for the presence of glia. Uh, All right, I, I, brief. I, I may also add that, uh, I mean, we have couplings between neurons and uh, glial cells, astrocytes, but also we, are, we have vascular coupling and metabolism. So if we go in that direction, I mean, uh, I would definitively, in fact, go to a, mod a model of the neuroglio-vascular coupling, which might also be important in, uh, I mean, for neuromodulation and, uh, and, and brain activity. Can I add one thing? So, related to astrocytes, so uh, from, from, the, from the studies that looked at the activity of astrocytes, for instance, the calcium influx into astrocytes, you typically find that they respond uh, quite late. So, with a delay that looks a little bit like the delay of the bolt response. So if, if you think that an astrocyte might be determining whether something kind of reaches consciousness or not, it's probably, I don't think that's the case because two, four seconds is a long time. But they, of course, they are important for keeping the whole system in, in, in the right state, basically permitting maybe those, those conditions that permit consciousness. All right, thank you. There's another question here. <coughs> Uh, today we are front of two type of uh, models and uh, a model like the blue brain with a, a million of parameters and a large diversity of cells and model of like a deep learning where we have a million of parameters but the, uh, the type of uh, mechanism implemented in these two type of models are radically different. So what do you think if in the future it will be the fusion of these two type of model will be the the interesting aspect of uh, introduced meaning and exact, uh, uh, capacity to disangle uh, high uh, pattern of uh, input and to have uh, self uh, uh, activity. Uh, I, I can. Uh, I would like to uh, say that this is one of our mission uh, in uh, the theoretical uh, part of uh, HBP is that is precisely to gather people who are doing models at different scales, but also different scales of detail. And, uh, and that includes models that take into account, for example, the morphology of the neurons and the dendritic excitability properties, for example, and up to models like the one we, we heard last, which is uh, uh, neural fields, which are uh, uh, models that are very, uh, very uh, yeah, aggregate, I mean, meso or macroscopic. And the, the link between them, the approach that we have chosen is to use mean field techniques uh, in order to start from cellular model and to generate mesoscopic model. Uh, right. <coughs> it's not deep learning, no. The, on, on the point of view of deep learning, there is something else, which is, which is to use but deep, deep learning. Yeah. Yeah. But there was no deep learning this morning. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday, yes. Mm -hmm. I was talking of the model we had this morning. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, first, now. So um, I want to um, come to the question of the wh why different sensory modality actually feels really different. And uh, the approach like you know, Sean is doing uh, possibly can address that because uh, potentially different kind of uh, cortical areas may have a very different local you know, structures and that, you know, uh, if the IIT is correct, then, you know, if you uh, compute uh, integrated information shape according to each, you know, uh, different local areas, it may create completely different shape, which may, you know, fit with our difference in the quality of the, you know, uh, sensation. But uh, uh, now the question is to Carl, uh, is there any kind of, uh, you know, uh, principle or prediction that uh, this very general, you know, framework of the free energy principle or, prediction error minimization, that can actually say anything about the why the sensory modality actually feels different. Like why vision feels this way and why audition feels that way? Um, well, a, a deflationary answer would be that that is just part of um, 
the notion that internal states in, uh, dis in a distributed way uh, stand in for or encode beliefs about external states. So the very fact it's distributed over different states associates the, um, the belief updating uh, with a distinction. I think probably the more interesting um, answer, or at least uh, ref re uh, reflecting the question back to you, um, would um, benefit from um, David's uh, meta-problem perspective. So the very fact you're asking that question makes me think that you have the sort of brain that entertains the hypothesis that the perception of a colour and a particular sound would feel to you exactly the same. And that, that's quite a remarkable hypothesis, fantastical hypothesis to entertain. The very fact that you can entertain that hypothesis, I think is probably more telling than any answer that I could supply to you to, 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 to you know, uh, address or, or, uh, or resolve the question. The very fact you're answer, asking that question. So what's the alternative? What did you have in mind? So the alternative, uh, I, I think, you know, one possibility is that the informational uh, structure or causal kind of pattern, which is still abstract, but uh, could be very specific for different types of the sensation. And it doesn't actually also exist for the kind of the sensation that we cannot have consciously, like an you know, ultrasound or uh, uh, radiation or magnetic kind of stuff that even that causes some kind of neuronal uh, excitation, it doesn't feel anything to us. And that is the kind of the thing that you can even not question why you know, magnetic sensation is different from vision. You know, this is a you know, reverse meta, uh, meta problem of cognition, right? You know, if you don't have something like you know, ultrasound sensation, you can even not ask the question. So, uh, to me, the, the, the very fact that I can ask why vision feels different from you know, audition is really because I feel these things uh, you know, in different way, and uh, many people would agree, I think. Right. Um, we take that as a comment, and uh, the last question goes to Rodolfo yeah, for this well, session. I, I have a very strange question. It is as follows. Uh, do you think uh, modeling would ever actually be conscious? And if so, what is really missing? <coughs> well, who <laughs> would like to <laughs> address this? Um. Probably the question is, uh, will uh, someday uh, computers be uh, conscious? I mean, yes, I mean computers in which yeah, we would not, have not, implemented not whether, models of- is needed? What is needed? Are your models already conscious? Yes. <laughs> we, we don't know. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> <coughs> I think you could also rephrase like how the hard problem could be addressed from the, the models. Of, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Are your models already conscious? If not, why not? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Carl? <coughs> yeah. Well, I, I think a practical answer actually picks up on the question before, where does um, deep learning meet either the physics models or the implementations that we've heard about? I think that they're very close. Um, so I slipped into my presentation the fact that the objective function that arose from the variational treatment of the Markov blanket was in fact the same objective function using variational autoencoders, which are the most sophisticated form of deep learning architectures. Just another little aside here, convolutional networks inherit exactly the same neural field translational invariance of lateral connections, for example. So already they are very, very close in their mathematical structure. What is missing from current deep learning artifacts is this temporal depth that we're talking about. They don't do dynamics very gracefully because they're stuck in a learning mindset. Once you um, expand that mindset to include the online data simulation and inference with learning, I think you, 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 you are going to get uh, conscious artifacts, provided that they have the ability to self-model, which means you're going to have to have a lot of them playing together. Uh, if you're going to want to recognize them, you're going to have to make them look a little bit sort of uh, human mimetic or humanoid, otherwise we won't recognize them as, as, right. as conscious. Okay, yeah. Thanks very much. Let's give the, the uh, speakers a big hand of this morning.
right. Um, we're more or less on schedule then, uh, just a little bit late. Um, we can talk about the coming weeks. Yeah. Uh, so we continue straight away with. Yeah, there's no break. Um, there is no. Break. No, no, no. Just flash talks now. Yeah. I'd like to call uh, forward the first uh, presenter of the next uh, flash talk. Um, yes, please. Please come up. All set? Please come up. Yeah. Yeah, um, so we'll uh, continue with um, a short series of flash talks and we uh, appreciate your uh, continued presence. <laughs> yeah. uh, the first speaker um, in this uh, short session is uh, Marek Beiner from Jagiellonian uh, University Poland. Um, Okay, please uh, resume your seats and we'll go ahead. Thank you. Um, Can I see a copy of the... Mm, I don't think they have that. Huh. Yeah. We'll have to stand back a bit. Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and letting me uh, do a short talk. So, uh, uh, I start with a short uh, introduction. So. Uh, effects of severe uh, in brain injury can uh, have uh, th three main forms, like coma, vegetative state, where patients uh, have uh, eyes open, but they remain unresponsive, they, they are presumed uh, unaware, and we have a uh, minimally conscious state, where uh, occasional uh, episodes of uh, purposeful, purposeful uh, behavior occur, and they are presumed aware. But the Diagnosis between those two states are very challenging and uh, there is a very high uh, percent of misdiagnosis. And can we improve this uh, diagnostic problem uh, with uh, brain imaging? There are several, several approaches to that, but I want to uh, focus on so-called uh, perturbational approach. Uh, it means that we perturb the uh, activity of the brain either the main uh, approach is uh, direct, uh, direct uh, perturbing the, the brain activity with TMS uh, and measuring the spatial uh, temporal complexity of the response. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an approach uh, mm, supported by Massimini group and they, you can parameterize the response using the PCI. And then we can also per perturb, there's an alternative way, we can perturb the the thalamocortical system using uh, uh, sensory pathways. It has a um, very b big advantage, which is uh, uh, we have an indirect uh, stimulation and we are prone to the, the, to the um, peripheral uh, sensory damage. But advantage is that it is quite easy to administer. So our approach was uh, to use uh, uh, auditory steady state responses uh, to perturb the cortical, cortical system. This is a, for, for those who doesn't know what it is, this is a frequency domain response which is evoked by periodic uh, auditory stimulation. And uh, so far it is, there, 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 are some, there are some hints that uh, depending on the frequency of stimulation, the generators of the response uh, move. So the lower frequency, uh, the response is from the auditory cortex, the higher the response, uh, the 40 hertz uh, uh, simulation uh, uh, generates the response from the thalamocortical systems and 80 hertz from the brainstem. Uh, uh, the auditory study set responses, they have proven their uh, sensitivity to the fluctuations in the level of consciousness, both in sleep, in general anesthesia, and in brain injury. So we, our, our idea was to uh, use those, uh, those, this approach uh, for, uh, mm, for diagnosis or differ differentiating the, uh, uh, the disorders of consciousness. So we did uh, preliminary three studies with different protocols using different kind of uh, auditory steady state stimulation, periodic stimulation. So the first study used the 40 hertz stimulation with clicks. Uh, the second study used uh, uh, chirp stimulation, 
And the uh, third study used uh, amplitude modulated tones with uh, several frequencies uh, from, from ranging from 4 hertz to 40 hertz. And uh, to, to like uh, ref refer to the, the results of, the, um, of our measurement, we referred it to the JFK Coma Recovery Scale Revised. All the patients we took, uh, who took, uh, our, uh, took, took partic participated in our study, they were screened with auto emission tests and, uh, uh, and we uh, measured uh, phase locking index which uh, represents the stability of evoked response <coughs> across trials. And we correlated those two measures. So this is the first study. As you can see, we have a, a significant correlation between the co comma recovery total score and the PLA, uh, PLA index. Also, there were uh, correlations between the subscales, auditory and visual subscale. The second study uh, showed the correlation uh, between the part of the chirp stimulation which is uh, in the gamma range, uh, as you can see, also some correlations with uh, auditory, and auditory and visual function scale. And the third study, we uh, like co make a composed uh, measure. We averaged uh, the PLA across all stimulations. And we also got some interesting uh, correlation also with these two subscales, the 40 hertz stimulation uh, individually measured, individually give, gave us the highest uh, correlation. So conclusions, uh, we observed a consistent correlation uh, between the responses to periodic acoustic stimulation and CRS total score and its subscales. In all studies, we observed a promising uh, separation between vegetative and MCS uh, patients. And I think our uh, results like, suggest uh, that this method could be promising method for helping uh, uh, to assess the state of the patients. Thank you very much. Uh, it's time for one brief question, if you like. Um, yes, over there. Thanks for the talk, very nice indeed. Uh, mm, it seems like if, if you were to split the two groups, VS and MCS patients, mm -hmm. would the correlation would still be surviving or it's a general correlation if you mix like up the two groups, like right? Be be between two, uh, separate, if you split, yeah? Yeah, if you split the groups, would the correlation still be there? I, I, we don't have um, two, two small groups to, 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 to give it like uh, credibility to such analyse analysis. Like if we were like 15, 15 people and 18 people. So I don't think it will be credible this kind of analysis. analysis. All right, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next, um, next flash talk is by Etienne Hugue from the Grenoble Institute de Neurosciences, France. Working? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. So I thank the organizers for selecting my uh, presentation. So I'm interested in the problem of uh, control success, but from the modeling perspective. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there were many experiments for control success, uh, and recently in Macaque, like presented by uh, Peter uh, some time ago. And, um, yeah, so that gives uh, a very nice uh, data to, for modeling. Uh, we have directly the neural activity measured. And, uh, in, but uh, all, the, all these uh, experiments, in fact, have uh, there is like a battle between people uh, saying, uh, yes, this is part of the brain that has uh, um, the location for consciousness or this mechanism, so it's not very clear. And I want to argue here that modeling, large-scale modeling, uh, because uh, the consciousness is uh, uh, um, involved all the brain, most part of the brain. So large-scale modeling could be very instrum instrumental to better understand the condition for uh, stimulus-induced neural activity propagation on the full brain network, which is the physical uh, problem be behind because you put uh, 
a stimulus somewhere in the sensory areas and you want to see how it propagates. So it's really a physical <coughs> model. And, uh, and I think it's really important to take into account this emerging spontaneous state on the full brain network uh, because you can see when you put a stimulus that is the perturbation of this state. And if you don't have the right state, maybe you don't uh, have the right uh, uh, response. And it was modeled for the uh, Stanley Sazen has modeled uh, the, this type of thing with, with a um, uh, linear array of, uh, of, uh, um, of, of uh, yeah of areas, and also in the last paper about uh, in the same way. And it, I think it's so they have, have not taken into account the spontaneous activity on this type of network, but also the, the large scale network will we'll, uh, give uh, a different, uh, um, will be more uh, involved because this type of model is maybe as like two attractors, like a low state and a high state, and this may be different on a, on a large scale uh, brain network. So starting from spontaneous activity to model, uh, then um, the Spontaneous activity is mainly I uh, take just two 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 things that are that are rep that are seen in experiments. That is uh, functional connectivity, that classically uh, correlations or rest instant networks, and uh, on the second. Uh, so recently in uh, MIG or SCG uh, in tracheal EEG, uh, there were uh, avalanches where that were found uh, that, uh, in the looking at. Uh, the, the, the data with the uh, thresholding and taking uh, events and uh, computing avalanches. So you see this, this type of poor low distribution of size. And uh, yes, here I, I just take a result from uh, an avalanche analysis that is, that is um, performed on, on a classical uh, large scale brain model at rest. And uh, it happens that this is. This this is not possible to get this avalanche. They, you get events, but they are uh, on, on some on some nodes because the, the dynamics is too simple in this case. Uh, so there was uh, recently, um, um, uh, really like two two months ago, published a paper on um, large scale modeling on the, on backpack brain, and with a mechanism uh, for the uh, strong excitation and inhibition, they were able to increase this problem of um, that there is a problem of propagation of activity when you put a stimulus here in V1, for example, and you don't see many areas in, uh, activated. And you see a, a better here when they, they put these strong uh, connections, but, but this is very limited. This is a curve here, comparing the two, and there is a limited uh, propagation, so it's not really um, working. Uh, and it, it also requires a uh, very fine tuning, uh, it's not so uh, robust. So here I propose a large scale model, so that, that will be the result in my, in my poster. A large scale model to take into account uh, human connectivity from DTI, so, so you see the connectivity matrix. And I take local neural dynamics, uh, which are rate models, uh, with, but with a simple mechanism of, of neural adaptation. And what I find first, uh, I model the spontaneous state and I see uh, this type of activity where local nodes can switch between two different states in blue and on, or in red here. And I can reproduce the avalanche size, uh, the avalanche size distribution uh, for some parameters, which is power low here. And I can also better reproduce the functional connectivity here than uh, outside, that is for, for lower uh, parameters here. Uh, so that means that when you, when you have the avalanches, you have also the functional connectivity, which is better. And uh, this activity looks like uh, some recent experiments in uh, my cat monkeys. <coughs> and, and then the, my last slide is about uh, when, so when I say avalanche regime, I'm, uh, I'm here. I'm, I'm here when it's scale-free scale avalanche. And uh, when I am in this, in this uh, in this, um, when I stimulate here for, for, for this node, for sensory area, then I, 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 I plot here the mean activity. And uh, you, you see that when you increase the stimulus strength, you can, you can progressively uh, have a propagation on the network, which is go further and further, and goes to 
like uh, an ignition here. But outside uh, of that, with, with lower coupling, for example, you see that uh, you, you, your stimulus cannot propagate. So this is the first result showing that uh, how you, you can uh, have propagation on this type of uh, modeling. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, in view of the time, we have to go on. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, if the next speaker can uh, come forward, um, I'd like to announce Ursula Groska from Radboud University, Nijmegen. Hello, everybody. Um, Okay, um, main motivation of my work is the current situation of patients with disorders of consciousness. Uh, so those are states after acute brain injury and further coma, and they are then classified into one of the states where I'm mainly interested in a difference between unresponsive wakefulness syndrome and minimally consciousness state where I also take emergence from minimally consciousness state and lock-in syndrome together. Um, in order to establish a baseline for these studies, um, I firstly test um, healthy participants during conscious, conscious wakefulness and deep non-REM sleep unconsciousness. Um, and since auditory domain uh, is less likely damaged in uh, patients with prolonged disorders of consciousness, um, we test here um, a specific complex auditory stimulation uh, called uh, auditory texture sound. Um, so we basically have uh, five groups and what's natural auditory texture? Uh, this is a sound which have a um, highly variable local structure. However, um, its spectrotemporal signature could be used for recognition. Uh, and here, um, we provide with a constant auditory sin of the first texture, which at random point of time change into the second texture. Um, and there is also additional group of awake responding uh, for which we've got a change detection task following for the other is the passive stimulation. And uh, those sounds are example rain, example bubbling, example um, uh, fire, wind, and this is an example how it sounds. Um, oh, I hope it will be. <laughs> Do you help me with providing? So. Oh, thank you. Mm. Okay. Um, here we uh, take only mixing coefficient of 0 0.6, which basically mean that it's a, a 0 0.6 mixture uh, between the two sounds and from behavioral study we know that this uh, task was very easy. Um, so we first compute ERP response for the onset activity and uh, here we've got a classic uh, N1, P2 response uh, which was already um, decreased in the group of patients. Then we focus on the period after the change um, and here, uh, in a pre previous research on awake responding group, uh, we proved that change detection uh, in statistical environment uh, is uh, followed by the process of evidence integration, uh, which is mirrored by parietal occipital potential at the scalp. Um, in this study, the parietal occipital response was absent during sleep. It was also absent uh, if for VS patients group, uh, and we first think that it's also not significant from, for uh, MCS. However, when we focus on individual analysis and take only uh, EMCS category, it uh, revealed to be significant. Um, for the next uh, analysis, we assume that the perception of meaningfully different texture possibly requires differentiation, uh, and that's why we compute lempel ziff algorithm. Um, we computed for various, various time windows. So first we start from 
the period before sound, then for the onset, then for the change, and it reveals that for a uh, period two seconds after the change, um, it gives the higher distinction between uh, states. So these are the individual values, and here is an average, so sleep and uh, vegetative state uh, uh, were lower in Lambda Zip value. And then we take only patients group and correlate individual Lambda Zip values with a uh, total score of comma recovery scale revised, uh, obtaining quite high correlation. Um, so uh, summing up, uh, we show here that perturbation with auditory texture uh, together with differentiation analysis rather than ERP uh, is promising for diagnosis of patients with disorders of consciousness. And at this point, I'd like to thank mainly my uh, supervisor, Bernard Englis, and also all the other people who are helping me with my research. And I invite you for my poster, uh, which is today, so the shortest uh, poster session. Thank you. Uh, time for a question. Any? No. No. Oh well. Okay then. <laughs> Thank thanks <you>. again. <laughs> yeah.